I'd like to welcome you wherever you are. It's five o'clock in the UK, but it's maybe morning or evening, depending where you are in the world. So today I'd like to look at different cultures and different ways of understanding mental health, different ways of interpreting mental health. Last week we looked at spiritual experience and different ways of um, understanding that from different people. Could I ask, would you all um, mute yourself? Um, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll begin as usual with a PowerPoint, but if you want to comment, then do wave at me or um, put something in the chat box. Um, if you think I'm out of order in anything I say, then, then do make a, a comment. So I'm just going to share my screen, if I can do that elegantly. I shall give it a try. So today I'm looking at the clash of beliefs that can occur with looking at culture and mental health. And we're basically exploring beliefs about the nature of reality and health. And I became interested when I was doing mental health promotion in um, Northwest London. And it was my job to go into mosques and temples and churches um, and hospitals and clinics to raise awareness of different ways of looking at mental health. I was a medical anthropologist and my job at that time was to invite psychiatrists and healthcare workers and religious leaders together in a room to discuss different interpretation of the so-called symptoms. And I worked for NHS Harrow and Mind in Harrow. And the aim was to rate raise awareness of how to access the services for migrant and refugee population. And one of the community leaders, she took me aside and she said, thank you very much for showing us how to access the services, but could you raise awareness with staff about different ways of understanding um, so-called symptoms? So then it became a two-way process that I was teaching. And this small um, little creature here, that's me giving a, pre a presentation. And I became aware that when we looked at global mental health, there were two meanings of global mental health. The first was the export of biomedical diagnosis and treatment models adherence to the manual and agreed um, symptoms in order to promote pharmaceutical treatments. And then the second one was to look to export understanding of cultural models of diagnosis and treatment to promote cultural collaboration about um, the meaning of illness in people's lives. And these are a couple of interesting books, um, like one by China Mills, looking at decolonizing global mental health, and Crazy Like Us by Ethan Waters. And what I found was that our understanding of diversity was just the tip of the iceberg. And so we understood about feasts and festivals and hairstyles and music and the like, um, but we didn't understand the deeper aspects of culture like history, trauma, gender inequalities, different um, philosophies. And of course, we didn't understand the difference between first, second and third generation migrants. And at, at one stage, the issue was that people put a diversity calendar on the wall. So you knew when Chris, Christmas and Easter and Ramadan 
and uh, Diwali was, uh, but you didn't understand much further than that. So the calendar um, was quite simply not enough. And I became interested in issues around clinical practice and particularly with first generation migrants and refugees. And it was this diagnosis of symptoms because the meaning of the symptoms is quite different in different cultures. And people would interpret the so-called symptoms as requiring religious um, treatment from the church or temple and the mosque. There was no way they'd go to a clinical practitioner because it wasn't anything to do with with them and there was a problem my apologies for those of you who've seen this slide before um, there is a problem where we assume that our beliefs are universal and this is one case um, when i was working in a charity from a hospital in northwest london where a new migrant presented herself to the hospital accident and emergency and the staff assumed that her narrative about spirits and ghosts were delusional and they sent her home with um, devastating consequences so we have to be really careful about wh whose beliefs and i found this book interesting um, the spirit catches you and you fall down by Anne Fadiman. And it explores the clashes between a doctor in California and a refugee family. And um, they had a child who had severe epilepsy. And both the doctors and the parents wanted what was best for the child, but there were huge chasms of misunderstanding about what they really wanted for her health. And the doctors wanted to cure her symptoms, but the parents wanted to heal her soul. So their theories about the causation of epilepsy were quite um, different. So here's somebody jumping over a chasm. There was a psychiatrist and anthropologist, Arthur Kleinman, who wrote in Anne Fadiman's book, if you can't see that your own culture has its own set of interests, emotions, and bias, biases. How can you expect to deal successfully with someone else's culture? And he said, we have to acknowledge the different models of body life and health. And he said, biomedicine and clinical practice are powerful cultural beliefs and social, religious, and spiritual be beliefs may be equally powerful. And he said this, in a tension to illness is part responsible for patient non-compliance, patient and family dissatisfaction with professional health care, inad inadequate clinical care. And he said disease and illness are separate elements of sickness. Disease is a malfunction of the biological system, whereas illness is the sufferer's experience and response response to symptoms and sickness is when societies accept the condition and I've just put this map in and I seem to put it in with every talk but I like it it just shows in um, West London where the population is coming from and why we need to understand cultural ways of looking at, at health and people are from the Americas, North and South and Central America, from all parts of Africa and Europe, Central Asia, um, Australia, India. And for, this is from the Office of National Statistics. So we do need to understand other ways of looking at health. And this why should we address the health of migrants and refugees? It's because religious and spiritual practices are important, especially for first generations. 
and people forced into migration from their country of origin or where their ancestors are buried may be more at risk of experiencing episodes um, of stress. And forced migration can be the result of war or trauma or beliefs which are incompatible with the country's ruling parties and result in experience. So living away from the supported extended family and friends can increase social isolation. And that was before lockdown. I don't know how you're all managing with lockdown. Can I ask you this question just to consider for a few seconds, how would you describe your ancestral history of origin? I'm just going to stop sharing for a minute. How would you describe your ancestral history of origin? Would anybody like to um, suggest about their origins? Alessandro, thank you. If I get uh, right the question, uh, because it is based a bit on uh, our personal experience and intuition, no? I don't know how much we can really investigate uh, and detect the elements, maybe through a DNA analysis, <laughs> our ancestors, no? But in my feeling, um, in the experience on this planet, uh, I feel like um, coming from a strong Aboriginal background, I do consider uh, tribal dynamics very natural. I feel very alien, the use of money, the, the use of politics, I see them a bit like something that, practically speaking, is just uh, keep people separated from a um, perspective of fear, more than uh, as I consider in a healthy tribe, where uh, every member of the tribe is deeply aware of the common goods for all the tribe. And so there is not the concept of working, because it's more uh, when you can do something, it's an opportunity to show your love and appreciation for, for the other members and when some members in a healthy tribe have different uh, opinions basically like they mostly si sit in a circle with the chief with the shaman and they heal this different perspective so they consider unity as a condition of balance and health yeah. when they separate they lose energy this is, I feel, my ancestral background. So that's like a, commun a, a social community of equality. Yes, like mutual care in the awareness that like this Ubuntu concept, no? I yeah, am like what I am, thanks to what you are. We are all part of the same. All right. Thank you, Alessandra. Um, Bash Basharat Ali, you had your hand up. Would you like to say? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I think as far as origins go, um, I, th I think it, it depends on how you construct it. I think, you know, you are where you're from, depending on where you perceive where you're from. So it's how you construct it, really. And anything that can be constructed can be deconstructed. Uh, I, I certainly think other people would look at me and think my origins are South Asian. But really, it's all a matter of perception, I think. Yeah, and thank you. And people have different perceptions. I remember when I had work in Liverpool, I came from London and they thought I had a posh accent and therefore I was posh. Whereas they didn't realise a London accent is a London accent. So... What about somebody else? Would they like to share any ancestral origin? Craig, would you like to unmute yourself? <clears throat> I think, can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, oh yeah, sorry, it's unmuted then. Um, yeah, thank you, Nanny. It's funny, I've been, think, I've been thinking about this earlier this morning, and uh, uh, so with all the sort of challenges that we're having with uh, the... Uh, surface uh, the surfacing racism that's happening globally uh i've been sort of 
I've been sort of been really mixed up with it all. Uh, my, my ancestral ties are very fragmented, <laughs> to say the least. I mean, my so uh, my dad is Scottish, English, German. That's that's his mix. Uh, my mum is Filipino Spanish. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is I, I'm finding the whole thing very, very challenging, particularly with, with Brexit uh, looming up as well. That really brought up stuff for me. It's like, well, where, 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 what's my allegiance? Am I, am I English? Am I Scottish? You know, I mean, I'm kind of like all over the place and um, feeling, yeah, feeling very mixed up with it all and, uh, um, and sort of trying to find my identity, but where is that? <laughs> It's all over the place. I mean, it's funny. Someone said to me, um, said a mate made a racist remark uh, a while back, and they said, uh, "Why don't you go back to your own country?" I was like, "Well, which one?" I mean, I'm kind of like, I got, I got, I got a choice actually. You know, I'm from, from pretty much half the planet. My, my ancestral ties. So, um, I don't know. It's kind of like, I mean, I just see, I just see every. I mean, this may sound like a joke, but I, I see everyone as funny looking monkeys dressed in, in, in funny costumes. That's the way I, that's the way I see everyone. I don't see, I, I, I don't see this, but I admire the differences in, 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 in our monkey kingdom. I, I kind of, I respect how we have these different rituals, these different ways of expressing ourselves, you know. Yeah, and of it, course this, this concept of purity, excuse my bias, this concept of purity um, is a little bit stressed. If we all stretched, if we all did DNA tests, I, I think that would be quite a laugh, really. Yeah, I mean, it's, and I'm, I'm, I'm plus, because I'm, I've, my ex-wife sees Dutch, Irish, Kashmiri, so on top of my mix, my daughter's got this, She's, she's like, I mean, so I, she's like a global citizen, you know, I got, so it's like, how do I, I'm, I, what's stressing me out is with all the sort of, it's almost like civil war going on, um, with all this mess, uh, how, do, how do I navigate as a dad with, with my daughter, with all this, all this mixture uh, uh, in, in a world that is so divided, it's so like, you're, black, you're white, you're yellow, you're, you, 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 you know, it's like, come on, I mean, you just, you're just monkeys in, 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 in funny looking costumes, and I, I don't know, I, I was thinking it's just driving me nuts today, that's what, that's what it's been doing, stress, I'm trying not to get stressed out about it. Yeah, don't watch mainstream television, it'll upset you. No, it, it is funny, Krishna, you were finding it funny, would you like to comment on anything? Will you unmute yourself? Unmute. Um, where does one begin? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll tell you about my my background. Is uh, I'm of Indian origin. Uh, my mom and dad are from a place called Gujarat in India. I'm born in Africa because my father went to Kenya as a 13 year old. I came, we came to UK um, when I was 14, and I'm in my 60s now. So I'm a mixture of, uh, I mean, I'm, by origin, I'm Indian, I guess. But culturally, I see myself as quite a mixture of English culture, a bit of African culture, which I picked up. You know, it's, it's notable in our language and things. We picked up many and the food stuffs as well, while my father and grandfather were there. Um, I, you know, identity issues came to me long time ago when I first arrived in this country at 14. And at uh, about 23, I went to see what my roots were in India and spent about eight or nine months uh, traveling there and also meeting my uh, grandfather 
the only only grandparent I've met. Um, I'm I'm sort of laughing a little bit because this is sort of the life I've kind of led with all the questions being asked because I grew up in a predominantly English white area and uh, it was the color that was the difference. That's perhaps why um, the questions were always came up and majority of people here didn't, didn't even know that they had such a large empire and uh, we were really, I call myself a product or legacy of the empire, really. So that's what's making me laugh, the, the difference. And yet, to me, having covered so much of, I mean, in a way, triangle of the, of the earth, um, it's people, human beings, uh, you know, the human condition, to me is quite the same. But if I can link it with uh, the mental health, uh, that uh, Natalie, you're talking, you know, you're saying how it's connected. To me, it's very much connected with migration. I asked, started asking questions because within two or three years of arriving here, my father had an episode of uh, severe depression and psychosis. And it was, I think, to do with uh, coming here with about seven kids, um, transferring, you know, not trans transferable sk skills, but not language. So migratory process, and it's interesting what you're saying about third generation, because I've meant uh, of generations, I think it takes to embed yourself. Um, I could go on forever, as you can see. <laughs> it's, you know, it's something I've sort of thought about from word go. And uh, I think mental health uh, things are very much connected. All right, thank you, Krishna. Mm. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Krishna and uh, Craig and Alessandra. Um, you, you can see we're, we're fusion beings. We're even just, we're listening to the same um, session we all come from different places and we we've got different ways um fusion marriages fusion children um so this this whole idea of um purity is a bit of a laugh for me but um but uh, that that's just that's just me so this thing about ancestral origin and being displaced is is interesting. The sculpture is by Ferry Faramandi. She's originally from Iran. And there's the issues around being displaced, um, displaced people with regard to loss and bereavement and grief where we've lost our ancestral um, home, there may be homelessness, uh, we may have reduced relatives and family support, um, problems with employment or accommodation and status, we may have experienced the trauma of war or the, sorry I'm going to go back, or the trauma of journey um, and death of family members. This picture is from the artist Weiwei of the life jackets to commemorate the number of migrants that came across the sea. And then we've got um, people who feel displaced at home. And this has come up with the Black Lives Matter that we've seen in the last week or two, um, triggered by the murder of Keith Floyd, although he wasn't the first person. There have been many, many deaths of black people in America at corporate hands. And he's saying being black in America should not be a death sentence. But this particular murder triggered many people. And this is a colleague um, in Top Ness, um, Chukumeka Maxwell. And he said in a video, I was born a Negro, then I became coloured, now I am black. 
and he experienced discrimination because of his skin color. Um, and people saw his skin color, but not his qualifications. And in UK, we still have subtle prejudices with stop and search and death in custody. And we do have othering um, that, that we do create others. And the problem with health is that there's hierarchies of knowledge. And the dilemma that we have is where Western opinions dominate cultural wisdom. And it's particularly a problem for those people who have what we call mental health problems or extreme or anomalous experiences. And there is this assumption that biomedical models of mental health are universal and they, they are not. I want to look this in this session, looking at religion and what we understand and what we find acceptable and not acceptable. So religion has an agreed concept of divinity. We know, we know who the Pope is. Um, experiences of spirituality may or may not fit within religion. And mystical experiences can change people's beliefs about the nature of reality. In the bottom picture, we've got a stamp from Belgium where we've got a rabbi, a priest and an imam, so the so-called um, major religion. So this is, if someone has a religious experience, it can come um, with those kind of imagery. And the problem comes with people, I say problem, with people of other cultures where their personal visionary experiences may not fit within what we um, believe about world religions. So we've got um, the water spirit, um, Mama Wati. We've got the China moon goddess. We've got Tyrona priest um, in Colombia and in India, the mother goddess. So if people are having these kinds of visionary experiences and the staff in the healthcare providers um, are not familiar with those, they could think, um, they were delusional rather than normal religious experiences. And I also found when I was um, working in charities that if people use Eurocentric strategies like have a printed leaflet, when people may or may not, if they're new migrants, may or may not be able to read, um, they don't impact the new um, migrants. And there's also these assumptions that are made about people who look ethnically the same and they practice the same religion and wear the same clothing and have the same hairstyles, but they have quite different personal narratives from, um, from other generations. And I wondered if anybody had experiences of the differences between different generations narratives. Can I ask that? What kind of examples do you have of the differences between different generations? Would anybody like to comment? No. Nobody. E Emily, would you, I'll unmute you. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's related actually to the previous question because, um, I mean, I'd never contemplated that my um, mental health struggles might be related to displacement, but um, my mother, my grandparents were from Holland and they settled in Australia. And in that process, I think, you know, there's a lot of resonance with the displacement of the Aboriginal people of Australia that I actually feel a very strong connection to. And also in terms of um, <coughs> their native spirituality and in terms of how I fit into British society, 
you know i've got a lot of the egalitarian dutch values and a lot of the aboriginal spiritual tradition and it's almost like you know even if i'm not interacting with the mental health system people just can't quite put their finger on why i'm not behaving like a normal british person and it creates exclusion and and division and I've found no matter how, how hard I try to bridge the gaps, they still want to put me in this other character, other category. And, um, you know, that is something that's contributed to my mental health issues. So, yeah. Yes, yeah, so and it's this assumption that there's some kind of normal. And, and uh, I personally don't know what normal is, but yes it can make it difficult to to fit in thank you emily so there's differences between the the generations would anybody else like to make a comment or shall i continue uh, yeah I, th I think i mean i mean <clears throat> i mean we sort of built in a culture where we view everyone like front covers of a book and we don't know what we only sort of see what's on the front we don't know what's even even for the person you know that they might they got their uh, costume on so we say but there could be a whole other other world or image that they uh, attune to if that makes sense um because i think i don't know how everyone else feels about previous incarnations if we go down that route or certain cultures that you resonate with and you don't not too sure why um i certainly have a, a sort of connection with American uh, uh, American Indian uh, native. Uh, I, I sometimes have reoccurring dreams of, of being an American Indian and watching my whole family get wiped out. Um, so I was always wondering, am I is that previous incarnation, or am I just picking up something from uh, a, a memory from that's been stored in uh, in, in DNA? I, I don't know. I'm just, I always try to look for a scientific, rational, logical uh, approach to this. Uh, but, but, uh, yeah, sorry. But great, we will be looking at that. We'd, from next week, we'll be looking at beliefs around death and dying and beliefs about survival beyond and as to whether you had a reincarnation or belief or whether the boundaries were thin between distances or whether you tuned into somebody else's. So we'll be looking at all of that over the next couple of weeks. So um, next week is on, on death and then the week after that, we'll be looking at those kind of um, experiences that you talk about. So would you mention them then again? Yeah, sure, yeah, sorry, I jumped the gun. Um, yeah, yeah. Got, ahead, got ahead of ourselves. <laughs> All right, thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to carry on I've got a case study here of some work that I did in India to explore people's theories of mental ill health. Um, I tried to get work, I was a medical anthropologist and tried to get um, permission to work in the UK and because I, in those days, I didn't have a medical background. Um, I wasn't allowed to talk to people with mental health problems in case I damaged them. So in the end, I met a psychiatrist from India and he invited me to go out there and talk to his colleagues and his patients. And what I found in India was that the mainstream biomedical and complementary practices work side by side. And then the book I did of my um, research in India is called Spiritual Psychiatries, based on, on the research in Calcutta and Pondicherry and Maharashtra. So I did 40 interviews with patients, priests, philosophers, clairvoyants, psychics at the ashrams of Sri Aurobindo and the mother, where people did um, 
outside the temples, they did walk around the outside of the temple, and they did rituals in the mosques. And my interest was, was there anything we could learn, given the population of the UK, was there anything we could learn um, from the spiritual and complementary practices um, for the Western world? And I found when I first applied for grants, I, I said I was interested in finding out if we could learn anything from India and I didn't get the grants. But when I rewrote them and said, um, I'm just going to look at native people's belief systems, uh, then I got the money to travel. So uh, you just got to get the words right. The, the psychiatrist that I met in Oxford, Dr. Basu, he was trained in psychiatry at the University of Calcutta, but it was um, King's College Cambridge certificate, so it was Western psychiatry. But he was a devotee of Sri Aurobindo and went to the ashram in South India. And he believed that Sri Aurobindo's philosophy about consciousness um, offered him a clearer understanding of ill health, clearer than the physical explanations. And with him, I visited a Muslim sage, the clinic of a Muslim sage, who the sage diagnosed who needed religious and spiritual treatments and who needed to be referred to a psychiatrist. And he offered deliverance from discarnate beings, spirits, jinn, subtle bodies, and he referred his patients, his clients, to the psychiatric clinics. And this is his um, surgery. It's, it's like in a straw hut, but it's like a clinical with a um, cleric taking down the recommendations. And the psychiatrist, Dr. Basu, he considered that the Western models of psychiatry and psychology didn't fit Indian beliefs about the nature of existence. And he said the problem was there was an underlying assumption in Western traditions that people were only influenced by postnatal experiences rather than past lives, karma, planets, or supernatural influences. So he said, that in the West, we tend to only look at psychology after birth or in the womb. And I'm wondering, do these Indian beliefs fit our own explanations of mental health? Do these own belief, these Indian beliefs fit our understanding, the spiritual understanding of mental health? And I just wanted to ask you that. Has anybody got any comments about that? Uh, Peter, I'm going to try and unmute you. Can you unmute yourself as well? Okay. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. <clears throat> yes. Um, I trained with Dr. Roger Woolger in past life regression. And um, he was... He spent part of the year in America and part here. He was generally regarded as the most competent and knowledgeable past life regression therapist. So I did, I did his training and I found it so interesting and fascinating. I repeated all his training and then he gave more um, training for his graduates. Well, I never started till I was 60, whereas most of the other people were already therapists doing the training, another string to their bow. But I found it so fascinating. And then Roger said, well, you've had all this training, you're to use it. Anyway, so I started. But first of all, with all the different training that I did with the practices, I've had over 30 past life experiences and I've regressed well over 50 people into past life experiences. One thing is about five years ago 
I started training at the London College of Clinical Hypnosis, which was regarded as as good as any other hypnosis training body in the UK. So after two years getting the postgraduate certificate diploma, I then went to the University of West London, which accredited their courses. This was the Department of Nursing, Midwifery, and Mental Health Care. So it's a Department of Medicine. And I took my MSc there in clinical hypnosis, but I used past life regression. So as part of the physical, you know, the, the training or to get the dissertation. So there were three people that I had regressed into past lives. So for me, again, asking who I am with all these different past lives. So based on what you just said, Natalie, this past lives is as much to me as this current life with my own just current narrative self. It's an inherent part of my understanding of the whole, whole of reality. Accident, in, incidentally, talking to Peter Fennick, and I'm, as far as I know, I'd like to say I'm the first person in the UK to get an MSc from a department of medicine relating to past life regression. Peter Fennick thought up to 10 years ago, I mean, it went through two ethics committees. This would never have been permitted or accepted. Yes, yeah, so you managed to, to get in the system because I managed to teach these courses in medical schools and hospitals because I always said, oh, this ethnic group in Africa and this ethnic group in India, and you need to know your multicultural clients but far be it for me to suggest that white people excuse my language had those experiences so uh thank you peter thank you would anybody else like to comment sure okay. hi um my name is gabriel and um i'm a neuroscientist and um i'm a consciousness uh, enthusiasts and um, I've gone through you know awakening processes and Kundalini and found that all sorts of interesting things happen and you know transpersonal um, awareness starts to build up in psychical types of things um, what I found is that um, relating to to the transpersonal in terms of either ancestral memories or as past life has more or less the same effect um, and I think that seeing how the scientific community tends to digest and absorb things based on what's palatable um, in the zeitgeist and what's culturally acceptable to the scientific paradigm, it seems to me that what that the ancestral memory might be something of a metaphor that that um, that fits they'll have the first entry into that paradigm as opposed to thinking about past lives, even though it's actually the same, more or less the same thing. Um, but you know, we, we already know that epigenetics has um, an effect up to 14 generations uh, as proven in like nematodes, for example, and when they have a memory, it'll keep going further through 14 generations. And in mice, things have been done where the fears of the father are transmitted across to the next generation. So I think that, you know, the, the plausibility scientifically is certainly there. Um, I've also found that one of the difficult things when going through um, ancestral or past life um, regressions and integration is to um, sometimes people get obsessed with the um, with the visions and the and and their identity and they start to sit, cling onto the stories of who they once were or what happened and they forget that all of that is um, as it were holographically available in this lifetime and that ultimately you know the 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 origins are so um, are found in dispersed aggregates across time and space transpersonally and in this lifetime that you can choose whichever beginning you want at the end of the day you have to resolve the emotions that you want to resolve um, or in, or you could obsess about how far into the horizon you want to go back so for me personally I've found and in people that I that I've worked with um, the transpersonal visions um, do have can have a beneficial effect um, to kind of have a feeling of there's a continuity and there's causality beyond your own conscious awareness and memory of doing. 
but then once you include that into your into your framework then that opens up new possibilities for either um, integration or confusion um, and so I think having some guidance on that could be could be helpful um, you know for, for people that are just beginning that process thank um, you yeah. thank you Gabrielle um, I believe that do if you can come on the next couple because we'll be looking at those issues in more detail because one of my propositions and it is only one is that sometimes people who are said to have mental health problems is that they have thin boundaries and they have a fusion of um, they may have a fusion of lifetimes coming into the present I was lucky when it happened to me I knew who Natalie was and I knew who um, that particular mm -hmm. lifetime was so I, I could distinguish but my proposition is that sometimes people who um, appear to have multiple personalities may be just having very thin boundaries between um, existences or of their own or of other people but I would like to look at that in more detail next week and the week after so I hope that those of you who comment um, would would come I'm going to continue for the last few slides and uh, so we're now it's from the conversation just now it sounds that we're more willing to accept those beliefs as part of our own excuse my language white um, existence I, I don't have to say any longer oh it's Indians who believe that or African people who believe that or um, so thing, things are changing this, this is a man I interviewed for the spiritual psychiatry's book Professor Kutka um, he was a lecturer in philosophy and he felt that Indians academic India's academic curriculum was culture bound that is it was based on Western thought and examined by Western criteria and by Western exam boards so students were taught about Western understanding of health and India's own therapeutic practices were neglected and he said although India gained political independence in 1947 um, it still did not have independence of thought so there is some kind of hierarchies of knowledge and we've really seen this in the last um, couple of weeks with what's going on because we've been told for decades what to believe about certain groups of people and what not to believe so there has been a cultural domination of beliefs but I'd, I'd like to see that changing. I'll just got a few examples here, looking at Islamic cultural perspectives from when I was working in Northwest London. Um, I saw an advertisement offering exorcism in a bookshop in Northwest London. And I wanted to know what were the symptoms um, that resulted in a diagnosis of spirit possession so of course I phoned the number, being a good anthropologist. So the, the Sheikh's explanations of the symptoms were spirit possession was severe headaches that couldn't be alleviated by painkillers, mood swings, anxiety, distress, depression, depression, seizures and infertility that had no medical cause and hearing voices or whispering. And in addition to physical ailments, um, human beings are susceptible to other influences like witchcraft, the evil eye, um, spirit possession and gin possession. And if you look online, you can find these um, healing, al rukia healings that you, you can find today for people who practice um, depossession or lifting of spirits. I also worked 
with the Somali community. I did a three year research project with the King's Fund and the advocate that I interviewed, he said, when a family see one of their relatives mentally ill, straight away they find the sheikh who can read specific Quranic verses that have the power to heal. This is absolutely different from an imam in the mosque. The sheikh has special knowledge about jinn and how to treat them. And when Somali people came to Britain, they didn't change these practices. So taking medicine, medication is secondary to, to them and they try to avoid taking them. At the same time, I met a female colleague. This um, picture is just a stock picture. And she wrote to me, as a survivor of mental health illness myself, I believed I am possessed by jinn and spirits. Hearing voices and hallucinations were to me voices of people from the dead and jinn talking to me. Sometimes I thought of myself as holy. Sometimes I thought I am under the spell of black magic and the evil eye. And she was treated for years um, by the community mental health teams. And now she's sane and recovered and not hearing voices and working full time. And this issue is, do we have spirit possession or do we have brain pathology and whose reality counts as being important and whose doesn't? Who, who is correct? Who, who has the right, um, who has the authority to say one is spirit possession and one is brain pathology? And I've got a few um, examples of open dialogue. We heard about it from last week. Um, these were African, this Ubuntu principles, which we heard mentioned earlier today, um, where we can't exist as a human being in isolation. We are all interconnected. So there was a system of dialogue in Africa. Similarly, amongst indigenous, American people. Um, this was Joseph Rial who got the UN, he got permission from the UN to build ceremonial chambers, the like of which had been used for thousands of years to have a place of discussion. And these are the indigenous American, the sacred Kiva in New Mexico. So the NHS in the UK nelfed the NHS Foundation Plus, they say the origins of open dialogue um, was 30 years ago in Norway. And I'm suggesting that different cultures had thousands of years of practicing open dialogue. Got the last few slides here. We've got Suman Fernando, who's a transcultural psychiatrist, and he's done all kinds of book on mental health, race and culture and institutional racism. And he said in African cultures, the non-physical world is inhabited by spirits of people who've died, people who are alive, people who are about to be born, plants and animals. Um, the spiritual and physical worlds are not separate. So he said in psychiatry, the mystical state is associated with loss of ego control and seen as pathological because self-control is considered important in Western culture. And he did the book on psychosis and institutional racism. And he notes, um, and it's the same in, in the UK, in the U USA, People of African descent, Hispanics and indigenous American are overdiagnosed as schizophrenic. And a research project was done with Yale University to look into the importance of clinicians' beliefs about biological, psychological and the environmental basis of disorders. And they found they looked at the consequences of the clinician's beliefs. And clinicians, they found, treated conditions differently. Their belief had implications for the effectiveness of psychotherapy or medication. And therefore their choice of treatment options 
um, differed for patients. So, and this, I think, is one of the effects we found that in the UK, clinicians offer different treatments for people of different ethnicities. Within transcultural psychiatry, I found that there is a range of psychiatrists who began to realize that their treatments didn't fit the patients or their treatments were not effective. And the problem was not only with cultural models of health, but with models of mental health different um, generated within religion or spirituality. And I'll look at this cultural U-turns and mental health in the last week. But this is a list of all the psychiatrists who have found that psychiatry needs to be adapted. And I find that quite positive that so many of them want to change. And the importance is whose authority is saying what diagnosis? And I, we, I know I've shown these pictures before, but it depends where you sit as to whether um, the six looks like a nine or the nine like a six. And the same with these figures, whether, whether it looks like, sorry, I'm just gonna go back, whether it looks like a three or a four. And it depends who's in power, who's in authority, at what time in history. So all these things are important with health. And so who has the authority to interpret the so-called symptoms? And this is Friedrich Nietzsche, um, who was a German philosopher, 1844 to 1900. And he said, all things are subject to interpretation. Whichever interpretation prevails at a given time is a function of power and not truth. And we're finding that um, currently. So my question is, what, what can we do to change policy? Is there anything that we personally can do to create change regarding the interpretation of the so-called symptoms of mental health? What two steps could we, could we each take to change the way mental health is understood. Has anybody got any comments on that? Alessandro, would you like to unmute yourself? Yes. Yeah, but this is um, like a topic so rich in terms of uh, substance because uh, basically, like the logical way would be to observe the circumstances and uh, yeah, finding a way to um, increase the awareness of people and give them tools, make them have experiences about uh, what is real respect, connection. But what I believe is the greatest obstacle, uh, it's actually this... Um, this condition of, uh, I don't want to use like this uh, complotism and stuff, but I see as really a small group of people on the planet that um, I don't say they are bad, they have bad intention, but they are able to generate dynamics in the society that affects and bypass the power of the people through governments. So for example, to solve something like that, uh, with the power the media have today, you really, yeah, you should stop, look the mainstream media, because they really programming the brain of the people. And uh, in this way, like our culture that has so many um, evil act in the past, like genocide, like we live in a condition of uh, privilege, uh, be not because we are more intelligent, more compassionate, more aware, but because we have been stealing since generation from South America, North America, Africa. So we brought all this richness and now we can play with art, music and painting while third, three thirds of the world, like 
big part of the world is uh, suffering with many problems. And so I believe until we don't fix that, that situation, like having uh, survival needs for everybody, it's like we not being serious and nothing really can change because we fall into hypocrisy. Like, oh yes, we want to be good, but we feel uh, disempowered into bringing real quality of life for other people. So, um, please, please. No, but my, my interest is in what steps, we, we know that mainstream media is curious. Yeah. Um, even social media, I've been targeted if I put something about homeopathy, I'm targeted for three weeks that I'm putting up yes. this information. As but, steps, but I, would, uh, I would envision a movement from law, of aware, initially from aware people that are able to generate social platform where people can have experience again of uh, what could be the dynamic of life in harmony, in respect. So kind of something like eco villages, for example, some kind of eco villages where people doesn't need to focus on working because with the technology we have today, we can work three months every year to produce all what is needed if we work in turn, for example. So, so my question is like, like the African Ubuntu, my question is to everybody, thank you, Alessandra. Please, is, you're welcome. Um, what is there a step that each one of us can take um, personally or are we already taking steps w would anybody like to make a, a comment about the steps that they can take samantha and then bash it up ali okay i think um i'm just going to use uh, sleep paralysis as an example because i've been speaking to a lot of people that have sleep paralysis and um I did a study um, at university about a year and a half ago on uh, what is helpful for people that suffer from sleep paralysis and how they share their experiences with others and their experience um, with doctors in, in discussing this, how the doctors uh, react to this. And I think one of the things that really came out is that there's, there's so much information out there on sleep paralysis. Um, but people don't know about it, like a lot of doctors don't know about it and a lot of patients don't know about it, often because it's not open access. Um, so I think each of us, if we're passionate about one certain topic, what we could do is um, try and research and gather this information and create discussions and um, maybe create, facilitate meetings or make a website to uh, make it accessible for people. Yeah, thank you, Samantha. I think, Joe, you're doing something towards that end. Would you like to make a comment? And then Basharat Ali. Um, I want to think what to say, really. Um, I guess I'm trying to invite like speakers to do things around mental health, spirituality, um, and then trying to see if we could do sort of support groups where people can share their own experiences and then see if we can sort of develop projects around that and then see where that, what ways that can go forward. So I was even thinking about if getting um, like a newsletter or like an online magazine where people could contribute from like different parts of the world and having different perspectives and from different disciplines. And if that could like get circulated around to different um, people, it could like make a real impact. Mm, thank you. Thank you, Do Joe. Uh, Bashara Ali, you wanted to make a comment. Uh, yeah, sure. I think what 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 you can do is, uh, I, I think the, the only thing that came to my mind is just start start with yourself. If you understand that the way the way I see things, understand how that that came about personally, and also sort of the culture I grew up in, and then sort of epistemologically there's you know how knowledge is is constructed and validated in the society and if you become conscious of all that because everybody does that but not consciously it's all unconscious if you're consciously aware of how you construct your perspective you're then able 
to see that your perspective is only relative. It's just a relative perspective. Therefore, it's much easier then to see other perspectives uh, as real. But we've decided in the West, because of positivism, what is real. And um, it's actually a framework, a box. And if you don't, if it doesn't fit in that box, then um, it's therefore not real. And that, that's what we've done. But I mean, to question like positivism, to question science, the way that science arrives at knowledge, and to suggest other forms of getting, achieving knowledge, or even, you know, discussing what knowledge is, um, to do that, it's like being a, you know, a heretic from the Middle Ages, questioning the Catholic Church and saying, oh, no, the earth moves, rotates around the so no, the earth is uh, actually spherical, not not flat. And then you're a heretic, and big bit you're really challenging um, a construction of reality, really. And, and people people get a bit upset if you do that. So uh, I think that what what we can do as far as mental health goes is uh, I think all mental health distress makes sense to the person going through it. There is you know, a sense to it, to them. But, um, yeah, I think if you can understand all of your own assumptions that you overlay and everything, and, and that can be quite a deep process, um, you can better understand how other cultures overlay different assumptions, really. I don't know if that makes any sense, but um, there you yes, go. Yes, you, you might be interested. Thank you, Bashrat Ali. The maybe you may be interested in the Galileo project if you look that up because they've been looking into different states of consciousness and different ways of looking at things and, and considering science yeah and I think there is some we have some way to go with mental <coughs> health because I think um, um, my thinking is a bit extreme even for some of them but let's not go there right now. Would thank you. Would anybody else like to make a comment before we tie up? Yeah. Um, Georgie. Um, I just wanted to say, I, I don't think your thinking is extreme at all. I think it's very valid and uh, everybody needs to hear it. Um, for me, I was just thinking, um, you know, within mental health, a lot of the power is within the psychiatry. Um, so, and I always think to change, you need to change your own perspective um, to really get that experiential point of view. Um, I don't know if this would ever happen, but if all psychiatrists could maybe go on some um, psychedelic trip or something to <laughs> expand their consciousness, I think it takes a shift in you know, your, your own personal conscious perspective of reality to understand then you know, others in their whatever reality that might be. So then they're not just reality checking into their own worldview, um, coming from a very like subjective point of view, if they're gonna drug a, a patient or not. Um, so that was just one little thing that came to mind. I mean, if ever there would come a day that that would happen, um, who knows? But I definitely think, you know, if we all come back to ourselves and, whether that be a stronger connection to the divine, our own higher self, um, you know, maybe come back to our own spirits and our souls, because then we do have all the knowledge available to us that we need. Um, so there we go. They're just my views, but I think your thinking is brilliant, Natalie. <laughs> it's on the edge. <laughs> it's on the edge. Um, and uh, thank you, Georgie. Um, Fola, would you like? to make a comment and can I ask those people who came late to say where they are in the world in the chat box can I ask you to do that as well Fola would you like to say something yeah yeah I apologize I was kind of late I was in another call but thanks Joe for inviting me here and um, I'll have to catch the recording uh, but I live in Edmonton Canada um, and I love like all the comments I completely agree as a, someone who works in mental health like I'm a psychiatric nurse by trade um, 
And I also have had my own personal experience with like spiritual emergence and some other mental health things. I feel like, yeah, all those points are very valid. I feel like more education is necessary amongst like staff or practitioners within like mental health, the mental health field. Um, more of a conversation around like just this like open perspective of like spirituality and culture and just how it is important that we have an open mind because we never know what people are going through and where they've come from. Um, and I know for myself being like someone who's kind of has a mixed bag of a background culturally and grew up in the Middle East and in Canada, like I've kind of experienced a wide range. So it's like really given me an edge, I guess that way to, to try and see people and try to at least understand a little bit or at least hear them, what they have to share around their experience. And I think it's really about like normalizing. Um, and then, yeah, I completely ag agree with Georgie. I think uh, with the whole idea of, I one thing that I can see amongst many of my like colleagues within mental health is this sort of uh, disconnect between like self-development. And I think that's something that's really important for, for everyone, right? And obviously not everyone, we can't force people to go into self-development or spirituality, but I think, uh, I can see it, especially within like the clinical social workers that uh, they train in our province, at least they, they require them to go through training um, for their schooling and like the, the uh, clinical piece, but also like the personal work, right? They go through counseling, they dive into some of their own, um, their own issues or the way they perceive things. And that's really helpful. And I can just tell the difference between the, how they approach clients um, in the setting that I work with, the mostly community and then other people, right? Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot to be said there and it's just really about having the conversation more and more about like topics like this and um, hopefully it will it'll make a shift again. I, I hope so, thank you, Fola, because up, up till now, as a medical anthropologist, I've managed to get things into medical schools and hospitals um, by talking about cultural diversity. But really what we're talking about is beyond cultural diversity. It's, it's a normal part of human experience to um, have these um, expanded consciousness. And I think we, we need to know that and, and explore other kind of the labels that have been used and the different ways of treating in different societies. And that's what I'd like to see. So next week, we'll be looking at different understandings of death and dying and beyond from different cultural perspectives. And the week after we're looking at um, beliefs about beyond reincarnation, expanded perception, near-death experience, out-of-body experience, all those things that people seem to have. And then if they get distressed or severely anxious, then they're labeled with a psychiatric um, diagnosis. And that's what I'd like to see changed. Would anybody like to make a comment before we all unmute and say goodbye? Um, could, could I, yeah, I think it's, it, it's interesting that that thing you, you, you mentioned about, um, I mean, like with spiritual awakening, spiritual emergence, spiritual emergency, that we, we don't have models in the West that, that these these are growth processes. We don't have enough of those. We, we, well, it's certainly not mainstream, is it? I know, I know there's graph and everything, but there's yeah, not... there's graph. There's there's the work of Alistair Hardy. We looked at this last week. All um, right. Of um, collecting six thousand experiences. Katie Mottram's doing um, similar work. So it needs to be made more normal. But we're, we're pathologizing a lot of what we're doing is pathologizing 
growth uh, and pathologizing what what is normal based on a perception of normal so yeah but whoever's whoever controls the power says what's normal it's about power yeah i think so as well it's, it's actually a powerful isn't it? How, i mean in mental illness is business isn't it i mean it's big business yeah. it, 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 illness is business that's what that's what it's centered around isn't yeah. it the whole Far, farmer in, the yeah. farm yeah. industry yeah. if you trace back psychiatry it's all built around sure know, Selling, <laughs> selling, it's far, and, 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 and illness is business. You know, if you're oh, yeah. um, um, uh, you go take this drug. Uh, I've got shares in this. Fund, okay, so, but I don't think. I mean, it's it's not about. I suppose it's going to be difficult to change Western psychiatry. I mean, it's. Yeah. I just finished this one. Sorry. It, I think because we've all experienced. An awakening we've all experienced great spirit what have you whatever contact i don't know what everyone's experience is but you found alternative ways of navigating this yeah. like this is, a, this is a first step in healing this this community uh, we're able to share our experiences and trying to come up with some kind of i don't know we're trying to find some kind of scientific rational logical way uh to for, for, you know because there's no one size that fits all isn't it it's quite a difficult one because everyone's having their own unique their own navigating their own terrain, their own invisible realm of, you know, whatever they're going yeah, through. Right, yeah. But I, I, see, I see it all generally as, as evolution. That's the way I see it. it even though parts of it are quite hard yeah, and, so, and some of it can be quite dark, yeah. it's, 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 it's evolution, I think, evolution. So I, 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 think, I think it's rather than trying to change something, create alternate platforms. I mean, I'm, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a media. I mean, my interest is to try and find a way uh, using the media of a film to try and get uh, what, we're, what we're discussing, what we're talking about and trying to use that as a platform to, to create a, 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 an arena where people can go to. I mean, definitely they should have books like Stanislav Groff in psychiatry. Uh, like psychiatrists should be reading this stuff. They should have, an, they should, because I, I, I regard, um, I'm very interested in shamanism, the wounded healer, you know, lived experience so that you can heal yourself and then you can heal other people who have gone through the same uh, yeah. uh, crap, basically. Um, there was um, a psychiatrist, Cecil Hellman, who did the book Culture, Health and Illness, and he also did a book on suburban shamanism. He's passed, um, he's died now some years back. He died early. So, and there's the book um, by Ethan Waters that was told to me, given to me by a medical student. So I think we've just got to have it as normal within the system. And I think with this current upheaval that we're having with Black Lives Matter, it's, it's kind of offered an opportunity for all of us to present other ways of thinking that are normal to us and we'd like to see them normal in in the healthcare system and i think change can happen that's what i'm i'm hoping so i like to say goodbye to everybody if you can unmute yourself and say goodbye and um, bye bye. I look forward to seeing you. Bye. 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 Bye.